a research talk. As the name suggests, CREM, Center for Research Excellence in Marketing. At CREM, we aspire to achieve research excellence in the field of marketing to provide relevant and rigorous insights into complex marketing phenomena such as growing globalization, customer centricity, digitization and sustainability in order to provide engaging and sustainable value to the stakeholders. While we do so, the idea is to address practitioners challenges and dilemmas within a wide range of global and strategic marketing issues. Therefore, CREM mission is of twofold. One, to excel in the field of implementable marketing knowledge creation and dissemination to minimize the gap between industry and academia and second to establish a partnership with industry and government agencies to provide solutions to complex marketing challenges in the ever-changing business environment and to achieve this mission the center envisions to develop a collaborative and networked community of academicians and industry practitioners to create a rich experience and foster learning in marketing research. Further at CREM, we not only focus on mainstream business issues, but also intend to serve government sector agencies, non-profit organizations and policy makers, helping them with insights into the area of citizenship engagement, social innovation, grassroots innovation and make in India branding. The CREM team constitutes the best in the field, both in academia and industry. And today, we have among us one of our advisory board members, Professor Werner Reinertz. Now I call Professor Shafali Gupta, Chair for CREM, to introduce the professor and set up the stage for today's talk. Hi. Good morning, everyone. It is indeed a pleasure here to introduce uh, Professor Werner Reinhardt. Uh, and uh, before I introduce him, I would like to set up the stage for this talk. So as you have already heard from uh, Vishali that what the CREM is all about, it is a very newly launched center, but we intend to do multiple things and impactful stuff in the center uh, through impactful research where the stakeholders would be FPM students, PGP students, MICA faculty members as well as the global community in the research. At the same time, uh, today's talks uh, context uh, and the agenda is that couple of months back we initiated a scholar box knowledge series on our social media platforms. We call it scholar box series and in that series every week twice twice every week, every Tuesdays and Friday, we post the academic and managerial articles, the synopsis of those articles, which can be taken by the researchers as a knowledge repository in the given theme of the center. So for this year, for an example, the theme is customer centricity and sustainability. So all the articles are being posted on our social media handles, the synopsis of the relevant articles from the inception time to how the uh, customer centricity and sustainability um, domain is being building, we are putting that uh, there. And at the same time while we do so, we had the intention to set up the solar box talk series. So now today we are glad to have the inaugural talk of scholar box talk series with our one of the advisory board members, Professor Werner Reinhardt. So, Thank you so much for being with us, uh, Werner. And uh, now, j I know Werner doesn't need any introduction, but uh, you know, I certainly would like to say a few words about him. So Werner Reiners is a professor of marketing in the University of Cologne, Germany. Further, he is a director for the Center for Research and Retailing, which is one of the largest applied research center in the Faculty of Management and Economics. And he is also a speaker of the research initiative, which is Digital Transformation and Value Creation at the University of Cologne. Before that, he was the COA Chair Professor of Retailing and Management in NCR at France. He holds a PhD in Marketing from the University of Houston, Masters from uh, Henley Management College, England, and Graduation in Economics from Munich University, Germany. His research interest is at the intersection of CRM, digital marketing, retailing, sales, and advertising. 
In particular, he is interested in the questions of how firms can compete successfully in mature markets, marketing mix, efficiency and effectiveness, and the successful management of lasting profitable customer relationships. His work has left a keen footprint in an academic context. He is the highest cited researcher across the entire Viso faculty at the University of Cologne, the highest cited scholar in top marketing journal, journals outside the US. In the terms of research productivity among the top rank economists, his total Google Scholar citation count is 23,862 by January 2023. And his research citation G index is 147. His work has won various highest academic award in the discipline such as AMA Doctoral Dissertation Competition Award, Don Lemon Award for the best dissertation based on a research paper, uh, then MSI Paul Root Award, twice he has won that award, finalist of the Odell uh, Award, Vardarajan Award for Early C Career Contribution, and State Foundation Journal of Marketing Award for long-term contribution to the marketing discipline. He has published extensively in the top tier journals in the field of marketing such as Journal of Marketing, Journal of Marketing Research, Journal of Consumer Research, International Journal of Research and Marketing, Journal of Retailing. In 2018, he has been named co-editor for IGRM, one of the discipline's top journal, and furthermore, he has been the long-standing sta area editor at the Journal of Marketing and Journal of Marketing Behavior, as well as long-standing editorial board member for top journals like JM, Marketing Science, IGRM, and Journal of Retailing. He has over 54 journal publications, 7 books, 23 book chapters to his credit. He is one of the highest published management researcher in the HBR, the most impactful applied management journal globally, and almost 24 contribution in HBR, uh, Harvard Business Press publication. He is ranked 23 in terms of research impact by German, new, German newspaper Frank, Frankfurter Allgemein Zeitung. I don't know if I'm reading it right, Werner. In their uh, yearly ranking of Germany, more, German, Germany's most influencing economist. He is highest ranked researcher from the University of Cologne. His name is included in Marconom Twitter ranking 2020. His textbook CRM which is published with Springer, has achieved 25 million chapter downloads between January and June 2020. This is not just the academic uh, accomplishments. Werner has also worked with large number of international companies such as IBM, Alliance, Cora Group, GFK Germany, ABN AMRO. In addition, he has conducted extensively executive training program for many Fortune 500 companies uh, in his uh, record. So we are extremely delighted and glad to have Werner with us and looking forward to his uh, talk. Yeah. Welcome, Werner. Thank you very, <coughs> thank you very you much. Have. Uh, thank you very much, Apali, for the introduction. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me here and uh, being invited. Um, it's my great pleasure to speak to you today and share some of my thoughts with respect to customer centricity. I'm also curious to hear about your feedback and I have a couple of questions in between as well, so, so we get into a discussion and discourse. Um, please don't feel free to ask questions. And uh, yes, uh, let me start with my summary of thinking with respect to customer centricity. Um, I've been coming from Mumbai this week, giving a presentation there at, at Wellingcar, being now here at Ahmedabad. It's the second time that I've been to Ahmedabad and uh, really enjoy the, as always, the, the visit and the trip to India and its, and its many facets and colors uh, in, its, in its truest sense. So, um, anyway, so uh, let me start here. Oh, this doesn't go forward. Why not? Is 
this right. Is this the right one? No, it's some words. Is this the right? Do you have another one? No, it's not moving. See, that seems to work. No, it's moving. No, it's moving. It's moving. It's moving. Yeah. It's moving. It's moving with this? Yeah. Yeah, it's moving with this. Um, let me start with an example with respect to uh, customer centricity. Um, the example is about a retailer in the US. The name is Nordstrom. You might have heard the retailer, you might have not. It's one of the big dominant retail chains in the US. Nordstrom is known for its level of high customer service, focusing on customer satisfaction. You could, you could argue it's being customer centric by focusing on customer satisfaction. It has a top reputation, um, and it's the number one goal within the company to provide outstanding service. Now, here is the story that goes. The, the legend, the urban legend goes as such. I'm not sure whether it's true, but it's counted over and over again. An unhappy customer returned a worn tire to the Fairbanks, Alaska store. And then Nordstrom did not only sell the tire to that customer, it doesn't carry any tires at all. It reimbursed the tire. The story became an urban ur legend. How customer focused and how customer centric the company is. Now, question is, is this decent behavior? Is this proper behavior? Should you be customer focused in the sense that you even give customers the money back for a product he or she didn't even buy at the store? So, there is an important sentence. Not all customers are created equal. Yeah? And this is, I think, something very important we should keep in our mind. It's, it sounds maybe a little bit harsh at first sight, but it is important to, to, to register and to acknowledge the fact that some customers are more interesting for me as a company than others. And more interesting, this can be along a, uh, many dimensions. Yeah? One of them could be customer or customer value, something like this. So, is the customer always right? In my view, clearly no. Clearly no. Now, of course, we want to satisfy customers as much as we can, but there are limits to this. And it sh this thought should factor in the fact how customer-centric do I want to be and for whom do I want to be customer-centric? And where do I draw the line? So these kinds of thoughts should enter the manager's mindset. Um, behind this example is the so-called satisfaction profit chain. The satisfaction profit chain is something which was originated out of Harvard Business School in the 1990s, which was really focusing on oops, uh, here we go, customer satisfaction. And the thinking was, once I do my investments in product, service, and employees, I get customer satisfaction up and everything will be fine. And, and, and loyalty and retention and revenue and profitability will happen magically. And today we know this is not the case. Of course it's good and right to focus on customer satisfaction, but we need to do more. And we need to, we need to think especially about the right-hand side of this entire system that we, that we built up here. So. And this is what a lot of my research focused on. And the thinking goes as such. The thinking goes as such that on the x-axis, I have service level, from lousy service to top service. And as I improve my service level, of course, customers get happier. 
Customers appreciate this. How do they appreciate this? They appreciate this via the revenues that customers give to the companies. So these revenues go up. And in fact, once I satisfy them at a high level, they are delighted. They have all the reason to come back. Now, the problem is with delighted customers that the cost associated with very high service level starts to explode. That's the problem. Such that the associated profits maximize at a certain level, and after that, the profits go down and even become negative. So I, as a company, yes, I want to satisfy customers. I want happy customers, up to a degree. To the degree where I am still operating profitably. So today, the thinking is, what is actually the optimal service level at which I want to operate, and what is it for me? I am still being customer-centric. I'm still trying to maximize satisfaction given that constraint. But I also need to make a living too as a company. Yeah? So this is the underlying thinking. Um, and the basis of this, this, this picture actually comes out of, this is, this is one framework coming out of my dissertation, which was published in Harvard Business Review, and which is sort of sketching the relationship between the time a customer is on board, are these customers short time with me, or are they a long time with me, and the profitability of these customers. And then normally what the old framework said, the longer customers stay, the more profitable they should become. And what we found here, this is true to a degree, but in many cases this is not true. So there are many cases where short-term customers are highly profitable, and where long-term customers are not profitable at all. So I need to figure out what are the segments in my customer base. And from this, how do I treat them differently? This is exactly the customer heterogeneity. Some customers, of course, these are the greatest. Being with me for a long time and highly profitable, I want to have as much as possible, but then also I need to do something different to these customers. For so, in some way or fashion, I need to identify where are they located, and how do I treat them accordingly? Yeah? And this doesn't have anything, does not have anything to do with not being customer-centric. But I'm paying also due respect to my own profitability goals. Okay, so the underlying framework is in which I need to think, what value do I provide to customers? And what value do customers provide to me as a company? And if you span up this space, then you get four different segments. And of course, in an ideal world, you would like to have customers who provide great value to me and that I can provide great value. Because if I provide great value to customers, what do they say? This is my company. I have every reason to return. It is very hard to avoid a satisfied customers to return. Yeah? So that is an ideal situation because I'm playing off of my strengths as a company. But there are also customers who really, um, who really appreciate what I'm doing, but they're not returning because they're consuming too much service, they're calling too much, they're returning too much, they have too good credit policies, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they're consuming a lot, although they appreciate really what I'm giving to them. Yeah? So the, the, the challenge is, and the implication is, I need to treat these customers in a very differential fashion. And that, in my view, is also being customer-centric. Yeah? And now I can think of all the tools and goals and, and implications for managing customers because I manage the relationship. Managing customers mean, means I allocate resources to customers. I'm being lenient to one customer, but not lenient to another customer when it comes to a return, for example. Things like this. Okay. Um, now, this was the 1990s. And from there, a, an evolution has happened. This system, what I just showed you, is valid until today and will be valid going forward. 
Yet at the same time, research has explored many facets of this since the 1990s, service profit chain, loyalty, customer profitability, et cetera, et cetera. And I want to take you on this, on this evolution. So this is where it started in the 1990s, customer satisfaction on the very left-hand side. Then came the service profit chain. And then we started extending the service profit chain from just focusing on satisfaction to customer loyalty, customer retention, customer profitability. This was the time when I actually worked on my dissertation and I worked on exactly that problem. Um, what happened from there? Then the entire domain of, of CRM got flashed out. So we were looking at joint acquisition and retention strategies, customer retention as such, cross-selling, cr creating indirect value. V. Kumar has worked a lot on this, customer win-back strategies, CRM in an online environment. Um, and we also started to look at how can we link all of that to the value of the firm, so becoming even more aggregate. Are firms who do this very well being perceived by the capital market as more valuable? Question mark. And then from there, we moved into multi-channel CRM, social CRM. Now other customers, joint customers come in. We looked at customer engagement and customer experience, which was the natural evolution of this, of this, entire, um, um, of this entire domain. Um, and then finally, and, and along the side was this notion of loyalty programs, which has been accompanying us for the entire time. So you see, researchers working on this topic over time. Uh, recently, we have been looking at point management. So how can we, how do we need to design our point system such that customers consume it, and they consume it in the way that we want it, et cetera, et cetera. Once we let customers' points erase, you know, they don't like it, what does this mean to the entire system, et cetera. And this issue of customer base analysis Customer activity. When is a customer a customer? I don't tell um, a mall operator, I don't tell Nordstrom whether I'm a customer or not. I'm just coming. And then I might not be coming for a year. Am I still a customer? Am I be counted as a customer? What do, should the company do with me if I'm not coming back within a year? Should they try to regain me? If you would ask me, I'm still a customer, but I just ha didn't have a need. Things like this. So customer base analysis has been accompanying us for the entire time. And then the latest, and this is what I'm going to speak later on, is customer interface management. Who is owning the interface to the customer? So there are some interesting implications in newer research for that. Who is the legitimate owner of a customer relationship? Of course, nobody owns the relationship but who legitimately plays out the last mile. And there we see some interesting developments with respect to brands and platforms, etc. Okay, now, when we look at various topics, and I just counted the Google Scholar uh, citations of just the top five publications in every respective topic, we see that this domain, CRM, has had a massive impact on the on the marketing literature. So our entire thinking in marketing really has been developing, has been moving forward, has been influenced by, by these kinds of topics. And these are just the top five publications in their respective uh, domains. Um, likewise, when we look at what companies do, uh, these figures show the evolution of customer relationship management software investments globally and this has been evolving from 2020, 50.3 billion. This is the single largest enterprise software category investment. Across all software categories, this is the single largest. And this is going to grow further still to this humongous number of 123 billion globally. So this shows you where companies perceive to be the bottleneck. We need to systematically build a history, a database, um, a memory of our interactions with our customers on the individual level. And then we need to do something with this memory. This is where all these data scientists come in. I take this memory and now I, 
I put some intelligence onto this data to start creating new campaigns going forward. Yeah? I want to address these customers in an individualized fashion going forward on scale. All right. So this is what companies are doing. So against this backdrop, <clears throat> um, we are currently working on a study. So this is a very current study of, of, of mine and co-authors. Um, where we want to look at how do firms go to market? And how has this go to market strategy changed, if at all, over time? And what we are looking at is I go to market via my brand. And, and you see the definition here. What is brand managing a brand? It's a strategic process of developing and sustaining the value of a firm's brand, product brand or firm brand. It identifies and differentiates firm offerings from competitors to create distinct market value. This is what you do when you go to market with your brand. One way. The second way, you practice customer management in all of your frontline activities, in all of your operations, in all of your thinking, in all of your applications, in all of your rules, in all of your hierarchy, which is the strategic process of increasing the value of a firm's customer base. It, it involves identifying and understanding the customers that a firm can most profitably serve. And then bring the resources to these customers. Different internal configurations, different internal practices, different internal marketing organizations, etc. Different KPIs. Now, I, I had no clue. I, I didn't know. It was just, I was myself wondering, what do firms do predominantly? How has that changed over time? How is that different in the healthcare industry versus finance industry versus retailing versus energy versus da da da? I didn't know. I wanted to find out. So we embarked on this research project. What did we do? How can we find out what a firm is doing? Yeah, there might be different ways, but we found an interesting, I, I think, I like it. I found, we found a new way. Um, so I'll give you, just give you two examples. We looked at yearly reports. And yearly reports is how companies speak about themselves, about their results, about their plans, about their strategy, what went wrong, what went right, what we want to do. So we thought, let's use this official channels of a firm to sort of start interpreting how a firm talks about itself. What is important to us? So here you see two statements. First statement from Urban Outfitters. Talking in their yearly statement or quarterly calls about their marketing strategy. We were particularly pleased with how well the brands transitioned into early spring. In the current quarter, similar to the fourth, we expect higher market brand penetration in apparel. As the year progresses, we expect market brand penetration to normalize with the mix of our own brand product. Now, lo and behold, what is this company doing? What is this company doing? It goes to market via its brand, unmistakably. It, it practices brand management. It thinks about, speaks about, measures brand performance, brand success. Now, here's another company. First, we plan to continue to scale up our sales and marketing with a focus on acquiring shipping customers. We have seen a significant increase in the average lifetime value of the customers. Da 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 da. Further increase customer lifetime values. Da 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 da. Acquire those customers. What is that language? This is customer management. Very different. So, we thought can we identify a firm strategy by looking at how they talk? Because I don't know how companies function inside. I'm not sure they even will tell me. And whether they will tell me the right thing. And probably every company will say, yes, our brand is important. Yes, our customer is important. Da, 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 da. And it would be a lot of work. But let's take these sources, which are public, and let's run down a content analysis on this yeah? using AI. And then see, this is what they're doing. This is what they're talking to the investor community. So this is what we did. So, we have publicly quoted firms. 
we look at the text, quarterly earnings calls, annual, annual reports. These are the documents. We develop a measure of focus on brand management and customers. This was the novelty. This is, this is what we developed. What constitutes brand management? Which kind of words, phrases, sentences? What constitutes customer management? Which words, phrases? So, we use self-disclosed information to measure the focus. We identify the dictionaries. This was one of the novelties of the research. And then we observed companies, and we have 101,000 quarterly observations. Huge data set. Yeah? This is where the AI and the automation comes in. This is the new marketing research. Large numbers. So, and here you, I, give you a I give you a flavor for, these are the kind of terms that come up when you do brand management, when you do customer management. And these are different terms. Yeah? And how often they appear. And then we relate them to uh, the size of the text. So it's proportion of the text. What proportion of the text talks about customer? What proportion talks about brand? And of course there are mixes. Some companies talk about both. Yeah? And which terms do they use? Um, okay. And here is the result, big picture. We, are, we, we look at a complex model, we look at drivers, antecedents, consequences, but here's the big result. Over time, and this is a long time period from, this was uh, 2003 till 2020, long time period. This is the practice of brand management across all industries, very broad set. This is the practice of customer management. Both the practice of brand management and customer management goes up. This is good news. Companies do more sophisticated and systematic marketing in either direction. Um, both go up. This goes up stronger. And, and, and largely, this goes up on a higher level yeah? across all industries. So basically, this is good news for us. Companies are doing more systematic, sophisticated marketing, and they do it in two directions. One finding. Here is the split up by industry. And you can see distinct differences. For example, um, consumer staples. Brand management is much higher than customer management, which of course makes a lot of sense. If you are talking about Nestle, Procter & Gamble, Unilever, they communicate to customers via the brand. All they care about is distributing the brand. They don't talk to individual customers. They, they worry about distribution mix. They worry about market share. Yeah, they worry about shelf space. They don't worry about loyalty programs. They don't worry about individual customer acquisition. They don't worry about customer profitability. On the other hand, financials. Customer management, much higher. Brand management, below. Yes, a big brand is important for uh, 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 Fargo Bank or... Uh, uh, things like this, Capital One, but it's much more important because they also have the data on the individual level. They know how often you come in. They know what products you buy. It's large uh, uh, margin products. So they can manage individual customers, and they do. And you see, in most industries, and it's in fact customer management is above brand management, uh, except consumer discretionary and consumer staples. Um, also, where do we have uh, B2B, do we, do we split it up here? Industrials, you see also customer management to be higher, naturally. Communication services too, so because you talk to individual customers. So what we're doing this paper right now is under second round review in Journal of Marketing Research, and we have a full model where we look at antecedents under which conditions you do what, and then what are the financial consequences. What if you do none? What if you do one? What if you do both? Etc. Etc. Yeah? So, in essence, we see... Yes, please. Uh, sir, is there any correlation between the average margin in the industry and the difference between the customer and the customer? Definitely, I would agree with that. Between the average margin... So, so, I would say between the absolute margin for a customer. So, the absolute margin for consumer staples is very low. Yeah? So, you just cannot afford to put expensive individual customer management schemes into, in, into place. In B2B and other in finance, the, the individual absolute margin is much higher, so you can actually afford, and it's important to separate 
the unprofitable from the profitable customer. Also here in Staples, it is very hard as an individual customer to be unprofitable. Yeah? It's virtually impossible. Whereas in financials, you can be very much unprofitable as an individual customer. Yeah? So there are a bunch of correlation elements. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, I, I, I think so, possibly. But I think what will happen is, once technology, technology kicks in, and it does already, both curves will shift up. So it will be even easier to do brand management. It will be even easier to do customer management. So I'm not sure they're closing, but both curves shift up. And this is happening right now already. So even... I would say brand management companies are more and more able to do some little customer management, things like this, or build smaller brands that cater to more specific segments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, having said all that, where do we go from here? What is the route forward? What are some, some possible, and I don't know the truth, I don't know the, I, I don't know the absolute truth, of course, but, but what, what are some possible routes forward? Um, what can we observe? How do customer transactions and relationships in general evolve? You can look at your own behavior, you can look at the companies you know and what they do and the challenges they are pursuing and trying to interpret that and make sense of that. Um, decisions are being made increasingly at the point of need, not at the point of sale. So when you need to buy, you scan the, you, you scan the barcode at home as opposed to going to the shelf and pick there the product. Now if you scan at home, you don't even make a choice. You buy the product which is there because that's the barcode you scan for replenishment. Choice processes change, you know. Once you decided for a brand, the brand is in place and much further to re much more difficult to replace because you're rebuying the same brand over and over again. You're buying from home. Um, we have new types of transactions. Mobile, of course. Subscription transactions. Bot-based transactions. Automated transactions. For example, the German manufacturer of, of washing machines, Miele, they now have the system in place where they sell you the washing detergent in a box and it gets replenished like ink for the printer automatically once the box is becoming empty it's, it's being sent to your household so they they're excluding the detergent manufacturer completely and they're appropriating that margin you know it's it's something like a subscription yeah? automated buying you don't worry about oh do i need washing detergent anymore things like this um yes Say again, what kind of marketing? So, wouldn't this sort of a setup where, uh, yeah, where you know, you're eliminating choice, you're eliminating competition? Um, well, in this case, you use the word monopolistic. Okay. Fine. No, no debate. However, what the manufacturer does, the manufacturer says, I'm selling you the washing machine once. And Miele is a high-end product. They last very long, 15 years. I want to be more often in you with, with you in touch. I don't want to be in touch with you every 15 years. I want to be in touch with you every month. That's a legitimate goal. I want to have a relationship with you as a customer. Because I want to sell you a stove too. And I want to sell you a refrigerator too. But in between, I'm happy to sell you detergent. So that's the thinking of the manufacturer, and I think that's very legitimate. I was never able to build a relationship with you, but now I have the tools to, and I want to do it. Whether I'm successful or not, I don't know, but I'm trying. Now, the other thing, this one here, when you're at home, customers made a choice about a product, say a cereal, 
and then they re-execute that cereal. Now, of course, nobody wants to eat the same cereal over and over and over again. But in this case, it's the challenge for an individual product brand to enter, to, to build such a strong brand tie-up with the customer that the customer says, no, this is my brand. Yeah, so I get the utility from reordering your brand. I'm just making it easier to the customer. You don't even have to go to the store. Now, of course, it's going to be easier for the big brands. And that's where I'm agreeing with you, where you say monopolistic. Um, so, yes, maybe brand structures in the market change to a degree. Yeah. Yeah, that's on top. For sure, although I have to admit, these boxes are more expensive than the on offer promotion stuff in the store. Of course, they they want to make a premium. Yeah, so we we don't have to fool ourselves. label suppliers yes absolutely this is part of the proposition you're going to buy from us the ease of washing you don't buy from us a washing machine. It's the ease of washing. Yeah? And we, you, go, you can rely on high-end products, high-quality products, and we make your life easier. That's the value proposition, of course. Yeah? And what about in the price sensitive markets? That will be, price sensitive markets will not buy this. I mean, HP uses the same strategy. HP is selling you, uh, mailing you the ink. And of course, you know the ink they mail you is quite a bit more expensive than if you would buy it on Amazon or somewhere else. But there is a segment out there who values this convenience. And who says, I'm willing to pay that. I know I'm probably paying more, but I don't have to think about it. Out of my mind, finished story. And there are other customers who are price, con price uh, sensitive who will not follow that strategy. So that's typical market heterogeneity. And, and the question is, how big are the segments? That's fair. So the trend is very to a point that if I'm thinking as a customer, more and more of my time is getting in the use from the active process of purchasing. So now there is a situation where I have a lot of time say, and I don't know where to invest that time because the product Um, yes and no. I'm telling you, in, in societies like in Germany, you ask somebody, nobody has time. Nobody has time. Because 
you may free up time. You consume even much more time on your WhatsApp, on, on, on your fitness training, on this, this, and that. And people, the number one concern that people have is, I don't have time. Now, we have all these wonderful machines who do all this work for us compared to 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And still people don't have time. I mean, this is, this is a little bit strange. And you go to the U.S., it's the same, it's the same fashion because people develop new interests. There's much more technology out there. You need to learn much more. So I'm not sure people will sit at home and say, I have nothing to do. At least in Germany, this is not happening. That's for sure. That's for sure. Okay, so these are some changes. Uh, furthermore changes, I interact with the vendor, the retailer, the brand, on a continuous before purchasing, during purchasing, after purchasing. So it's not anymore the single interaction. It's a more and more continuous interaction using the mobile phone, using smart devices, etc., etc., uh, which also puts on myself because now I need to operate simultaneously. I'm, I'm, I'm communicating through WhatsApp, I'm communicating through LinkedIn constantly, and many other devices are becoming smart. So this takes its toll on my own energy as well. Um, so, which then begs the question, when I have all these technology devices coming in, this changing behavior, out of that or going forward, who owns the customer relationship? And it used to be very simple. The world seems to be very simple. It was the retailer who owned the relationship because there is where I was getting my products. There was no other choice. It was the marketplace, the retailer, and, and the manufacturer were selling to the retailer and I was going to the retailer. End of story. Yeah? And this now is changing. So right now, it is not only the retailer who tries to pitch to the customer. It's the brand who tries to pitch to the customer directly. Look up the many direct-to-consumer models, Adidas, uh, Nike. They want to sell directly to the end consumer. Apple, anyhow. They want to have the relationship with you. They don't want to cede it to the retailer. And the platform is coming in. The Facebook platform, the Amazon platform, the Apple platform. All these ecosystems are coming in, and they want to have their share of the relationship, the share of the time, and want to sell you something in between. The Google comes in and want to own it. And that is the changing paradigm, so who owns the relationship going forward, question mark. So we addressed this question in a paper which came out in 2019, in fact. Uh, and then comes automation. Then comes the bot in, on top of everything. So everybody starts to deploy and employ the bot. So what does it mean to talk to a machine and to interact with a machine and to, to, to interact with a machine which pretends to be smart? And of course, we know it's not smart, but it, it's becoming smarter and smarter. Chat GPT. Yeah? And this will not stop there. It will become even smarter than that. Um, so in our article in 2019 in IGRM, we developed the five new sources of value creation that you need to deploy in order to own the customer relationship. So these are the five sources um, in our IGRM article. Automation, individualization, interaction, ambient embeddedness, and transparency and control. What are these? The first is, do you provide value through automating interaction? such as the Miele example. Yeah? And for some customers, this generates value, that they can rely on automated interaction without having to adhere to opening hours, without having to ad adhere to personal interactions because they don't want, etc., etc. It creates value. 
The second one is more and more individualization. That is the big demand today of customers. I want my version of. I don't want any version. I want my version, which depends on my history, which depends on my preferences, which depends on my wishes going forward. Uh, Runtastic is an example. Runtastic is the app from Adidas. And it gives you suggestions if you travel to another city and if you want to take a jogging trip, it gives you suggestions which are geared towards your preferences of the past. It's amazing. You are traveling to a different city. You didn't, of course, not, you didn't know where to go, where it's safe, where you can run, where it's green. It gives you a suggestion which affords to your previous preferences, which is huge value creation. Yeah? Um, interactions. On a continuous basis, it's a back and forth between customer and seller, vendor, being it brand, being it retailer, being it platform, being it anybody, yeah? that we have a conversation going on. Ambient embeddedness, meaning I can interact wherever, whenever I am. So today in every mini car, there is uh, Alexa being deployed. Whether you want it or not, Alexa is in any mini car. You just need to activate it. Yeah? I want to interact wherever I am. Of course, given technology, this is becoming more and more true. I don't want to go to a point of sale. I want to interact here and now, or in my car, or at home, or on the go, in the bus. And finally, transparency and control. Things are becoming so transparent for the customer. Think about ranking and rating. I mean, who goes to a hotel today without looking at the rating before? So it becomes, with all that comes with it, with all the tampering and etc. but putting that aside, there is a piece of nugget of information sitting there that I'm trying to use. This gives me control as a customer. So you, give, you need to give your customers control. Yeah? So it's all in the paper. It's published. It's, it's, it's public domain. It's open source. You can download the paper. Yeah? Um, so who owns the customer relationship in the future? This is the key hypothesis of the paper. Yeah. So how, how do you bring that balance in transparency and control? You say the rating for the product is there and the rate... Nobody knows that if Nike is in on Amazon and that particular product is getting low ranking and low stars because the Amazon do not manage that customer relationship way. Oh, interesting. Yes, interesting. So basically what Nike says in that case, you know what, Amazon, you're not managing my brand very well. I want to manage my brand. I have a huge interest. I'm speak to the, exactly this point in a couple of slides. This is going to be the new development. What is the role of the brand? How should the brand? Because the brand is really coming under pressure. You have Google Shopping. You have Amazon. Everything is there. Who needs more? The brand is suffering because you have this humongous transparency. And, and I don't want this as a brand. I actually want to have a much better quality of relationship with the customer. I don't want to have this reduction to ratings and price. I don't want to be reduced to ratings and price. I want to be, I want to have an active, positive, rich, textualized relationship with the customer. Because that is what makes a brand a brand. Because a brand has a personality. Yes, yes, I agree. I agree. We see more concentration in the market. Yes. We see more concentration in the market. Yeah.
this is where we need a, where we as researcher need to come in and we need to work on these issues yeah. okay so um, so in the past as a retailer you compete and you succeed because you provide logistics assortment information the transaction itself and ancillary services these were your factors that you need to accomplish in order to succeed in the marketplace as a retailer at the point of sale. This is also true, to today, also true today. Anybody who sells needs to provide these points. Yeah? You need to provide logistics. You need to get the product from A to B. In addition, however, today, you need to provide these ones as well. And the key hypothesis of the paper is the participant in the retailing value chain, the manufacturer, the retailer, the platform, who will own the customer in the future is the one who generates those value adds the most effectively, i.e. those or those and those. And this is what we describe in the paper, so how to, how to go forward. Okay, so um, there was a whole, now I could, so we've spoken about the retailer, then there is the platform, and then there is the brand. The brand is sort of in the most difficult place because they sort of get squeezed out. Uh, they, 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 they are being shut out from the, from the end customer with all this information. So the question is, we asked in our newest paper, which was published in Harvard Business Review uh, just three months ago, what is the response of the brand? What can be the response of the brand? Um, so where are we? Here is the perspective of the brand. So you have brands like Whiskas, Miele, Runtastic, Adidas, Bosch. Um, it used to be the brand has a product approach. The brand focuses on the transaction and the brand operates from a distance, separated from the end customer. Today, the shift is towards providing a solution approach, the washing machine and the automated delivery of the detergent. That's a solution. Yeah. Um, interacting with the customer on an ongoing basis. Today, Bosch's devices are all interconnected. So you can save all the measures, all your projects in one location, and you can store them there. And you can look at other people's projects. Every drilling machine is connected to that. And of course, Bosch knows how many machines you own and how often you use them, things like this. Um, and it goes from distance to proximity, thanks to technology. So this is changing for the, for the brand. So this is where we speak, and, and of course, with the help of Internet of Things. And this is where the brand moves from shelf presence to verticalization to this notion of brand as a platform. And this is, this is I, we, I think, fairly new. So one example I want to give you, this is Adidas Runtastic. Rantastic used to be an independent software company, which they have bought and integrated it in their offering. So today, it's all about the making their original products, a shoe, intelligent. This is all the purpose. So it used to be Adidas was selling its products online, e-commerce. You can buy this shoe, that shoe, da, 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 da. Here's the price. We ship it. End of story. Now comes... The solution approach, they buy Runtastic and other software companies, so they have all these uh, devices which you can carry and that measure your activities, your training, your runs, your jogs, your bike uh, rides, etc., etc., and it goes towards the project approach. Adidas says, well, I'm buying shoes, but what I really want to do is I want to run a marathon. That is the product I want to have. So now Adidas helps you to run a marathon. And you specify, that's my weight, that's my age, this is the time horizon I have. And now they're giving you the entire training schedule. This is what you need to do in terms of training. How often? How much? Is it feasible? This is what you do in, need to do in terms of diet. The entire approach of train, eat, sleep, they give you via software. This is what the customer wants to solve. His or her problem, the marathon. I don't want to own shoes. That way, the brand becomes a companion to the customer in his or her life. And that way, the brand attaches 
new meaning to the relationship, which in Amazon can never do. Amazon provides you the cheapest Adidas shoes in the fastest way, and you can look at which shoe is highly ranked. Yes, Amazon is great on this. But it's not a good companion. And it's not helping you to run the marathon either. So that's the route the brand is going through. So. Technology plays a big role. I completely agree, and I come to this. But the challenge of the brand is um, I don't want you to look left and right. And in any store, you can look at left and right because there is an assortment. The brand doesn't provide you assortment. It only provides you assortment within the brand, but not outside the brand. So the brand really wants to constrain your view on the world. But it wants to, make you, wants to make it so powerful that you say, yes, I'm sure there is something outside, but it's not relevant to me. So the brand actively constrains your view on the world, but the consumer willingly says, this is my brand. I have no need for anything else. But because it does what I really want to accomplish. It helps me to solve my problems. And this is what a strong relationship is all about. When the customer says, this is my retailer. This is my brand. I mean, this is the best that could happen to any brand if the customer comes back. Um, I don't know. Possibly. I don't know. Possibly. Yeah? So, yes. Possibly. More data here. This is, this, is the general, this is the general path we are, we are walking down. I mean, this is why data scientists are in prime demand in any, in any country, right? It's, 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 it's not data policy. It's the, the, the ability to handle and analyze data. Yeah? If you link it to marketing, if, this is under great demand from companies. Somebody who can handle data, interpret data with respect to marketing as opposed to used to be somebody who can talk to the advertising agency. Oh, I think this campaign is great. I like this campaign, da, 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 da. No, there is no liking today. It's all numbers. Yeah. Okay, I want to make a final point to not run out of time. I think I'm, I am already out of time. I want to make the point about 
what is the role of the brand going forward? And, and what we pose there in the paper is brands can become platforms in themselves. Yeah? The brands used to be far away from the consumer, but there are ways for the brand actually to become a conduit to the end consumer. And the end consumer wants to bypass the, the platform, wants to bypass the retailer, and wants to interact directly with the brand. How can this work? Um, so we contrast what, so what I'm just describing is the so-called brand flagship platform, where Adidas and Rantastic, Bosch DIY, Nike Training Club built these platforms where they interact directly with the consumer. Irrespective of any retailer, you can buy directly from them and you have an ongoing relationship. And then here we have the traditional aggregation platforms like Amazon Marketplace, JD, et cetera, et cetera. So, in the left case, the platform mediates the individual transaction. It's an individual transaction. That's the goal. Here, it's an ongoing interaction between brand consumers and third-party partners. They're being brought in. Uh, the goal is to simplify the sales of the product. The goal is to strengthen the brand and to strengthen the relationship. Different goal. The focus here is wide range of products and services. The focus here is one category, deep, maybe adjacent categories. But I want you to be the fitness provider, number one, and nothing else for you to do. Or the kitchen and household provider, or the energy provider, or the health provider, or the beauty provider, things like this. Um, and these are typically, the owner of the platform is the born online platform like Amazon. And here, the owner of the platform is the born offline product brand, like the Adidas, like the Bosch. Yeah. Um, so to give you an example, Nike Training Club, what do they do? They have this brand like flagship platform. They have a brand shop. Of course, that's the basis. They want to make money. They need to make money. They want to sell you stuff. However, they have more. They have measurement. They offer you tracking of all your activities, which in sports, of course, fitness is essential. They, they offer you coaching across the various disciplines. Uh, nutrition and wellness, training, personalization, really important. Um, they connect to other providers' headspace. So this is where partners become really important who have expertise in technology. Um, they provide community, really important today. Yeah? Are, what are other people doing? What are other consumers saying? who are similar to me. Um, they provide motivation, music playlists, cheers, rankings, reminders. They connect to Spotify. Again, partners come in. There's a whole ecosystem that they build up around my goal of fitness, yeah? staying fit, staying healthy. Same goes for Bosch DIY, brand shop, core, selling products. There is community. What do projects other people have? They upload. It's like Lego for adults. What I can engage in, you know, doing a sort of renovation project. Um, they have an overview of your, you can register your equipment, uh, safe invoices, online magazine. Instruction is a big, a big thing. How do I do certain things for the hobby DIY person? Uh, and again, motivation, challenges, points, awards, ranking, an entire ecosystem they built up around the brand. Yeah? This is a brand flagship platform, and this is how they provide value. So, in principle, what's the principle behind it? You have a core offering, DIY machinery, running shoes, running gear, and then you build, like an onion, complementary aspects around this, which are close to it, like tracking, which are further apart, complementary products and services, tracking equipment, events, um, and then nutrition, adventure, sleep, food, etc., and that's where partners come in. So you build an ecosystem which has a sufficient breadth and large depth related to health, related to sports, related to beauty, related to living, related to fashion, da 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 And of course, there are only a few providers, that's where we have market concentration, who can afford these kinds of platforms. Now, um, we say there are four relationship types when you build brand flagship platforms. And here is, the, here is the, the, the key hypothesis we're saying. The novelty is, 
The novelty is that in this ecosystem, the customer draws information from the brand. The brand provides different examples for routes or building instructions, but also customers give info, uh, customers, customers draw information from the brand, but also customers give information to the community. So we have this exchange of information, and this is what we call crowdsourcing, value flows from the platform to the consumer. The consumer draws information from the platform, and crowd sending, value flows from the consumer to the platform. When you do a rating, it goes to the platform and it helps other customers. When you rate a track, it goes to the platform and helps other customers. So the information flow is two ways. And only through crowdsourcing and crowd sending, a brand platform, platform, brand flagship platform can be realized. Yeah? There is so much information sitting there which resides on all the activities of all the customers that they generate new value to other customers. So this is the principle. And then we have four, four, uh, um, um, four types. And here, a high degree of crowd sending, a high degree of crowd sourcing yields the platform as a companion, the flagship platform, the ones we are just described to you. And then down there below, these are the Platforms as an instrument, very functional, no strong relationship, uh, just transactions. Okay. Um, then we go on in the article and we define certain functions, transaction, community, benchmarking, guidance, inspiration, and different, different platforms configure their platform using different elements to a different degree. Yeah? There is no uniformity. Everybody does it according for some platforms, the community module is much more important. For some platforms, like Adidas Rantastic, the benchmarking module is more important. There are benchmarking on performance, etc., etc. That needs to be created for different categories. All right. This puts me to the conclusion. So sorry for speeding up a little bit. Um, platforms, brands, and direct-to-consumer, and ecosystems they enter consumer relationships. Platforms use other market mechanisms and add real value to the customers. They represent customer-centric thinking. This is why Google Shopping, Amazon, and Nike Training Club are so important, because they generate value to the customer, which retailers cannot do. In addition, new technologies significantly, significantly impact customer interaction. I think there is a lot of research to be done going forward, how this exactly is playing out. Um, also, labor and product shortages. You have, a, you have it as a lot in Germany. You simply don't find people who do certain jobs. So there's more and more self-service. What does self-service do to a customer relationship where you speak to a machine? There is no warm relationship. It's a very cold relationship, a very functional relationship. Self-service everything. Decline in personal relationships, uh, product, labor shortages. This is not a good way to make a relationship come alive. So how do you, how do you then function? And there is this classical example of this uh, pensioner in Spain who made huge waves in Spain because he said, I'm not being served by my bank in person anymore. They want me to do everything online, and this is wrong. And he was generating this huge protest in Spain, very, very public, uh, and he was very successful that he was pleading, every company has to serve persons in, in, in person and not only by card and on the computer what they don't want. Um, so this was made, making big headlines in the news. Um, how, do we, how do we serve customers? And how do we not leave anybody out who doesn't want to do the computer transaction? Um, so, how to remain customer-centric and how to execute CRM under those conditions going forward? High technology, self-service, uh, shortages, is not trivial. So, question mark, how do we do this in a, in a proper fashion, in a good fashion? Profitable for the company, but also providing value add to the customer. Having access to the customer relationship and managing it for value may be more important than ever. 
Yeah? After all this history of CRM, I think we're starting into a new age and, and, and doing this properly and correct and, and valuable, this is not, not, not clear at all. So I think that's also where there's a lot of motivation for new research comes in. Thank you very much.